Hi, uh, I'm Lisa Messenger, Associate Curator in the Department of 19th Century Modern and Contemporary Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And we're celebrating this afternoon the exhibition Stieglitz and His Artists, Matisse to O'Keefe, which just opened and remains on view through January 2nd. That's my homage to Halloween. It's as, as creative as I get on slides. Uh, this afternoon, just to give you a, a brief rundown, the Sunday at the Met, I'm going to be talking specifically about the Stieglitz collection that we have on view, some of the highlights of that show. And then it'll be followed by a short film about New York that was um, created by the artists Charles Sheeler and Charles Demuth, and then followed by my colleague Jessica Murphy, who worked on the exhibition and the catalog with me. And she's going to talk about uh, artists' views of New York within the Stieglitz Circle. And then that will be followed by two really short films before we uh, escort you out. So we're, I'm going to talk fast, hopefully not too fast. Um, The exhibition that we have on now, if you haven't seen it, I, um, you probably, well, I suppose you could scoot out of here after mine, but then you'd miss Jessica's talk. So hopefully you'll come back if you haven't seen it and look at the exhibition. And if you have, perhaps this will explain some of what you saw. My own preference for looking at art gallery, at exhibitions is not to read through them. So if you've been through the show, you'll notice that there's a minimal amount of labels We've tried to give you a sense of each room, what the rationale for showing certain artists together or singly, the artists that Stieglitz himself focused on. And um, the exhibition has just about 200 works of art in it, so it's quite a large installation, but that's only half of what the Met received in 1949 from Stieglitz's personal collection. Here he is, the great man himself on the left, and one of his photographs, a photogravure that was published in his magazine Camera Work in 1911, The Terminal. Uh, say the name Alfred Stieglitz, and some of you may recognize him as one of the great American photographers from the first half of the 20th century. His, he championed photography as an art form, that it wasn't just about being a document, but that one could manipulate it and one could make it an equal to what paintings were. So in that sense, he's really a pioneer in photography. But the exhibition, although we show a couple of, uh, there's one room of his photographs, and on view at the same time down the hall is a whole exhibition of photo secessionist photographs. That was the group that Stieglitz was a leader of, and for whom he opened a gallery in New York called the Little Galleries of the Photo Secession in 1905. Um, it was later, sort of shortly after it opened, it started to be called 291, which was based on the address at 291 to Fifth Avenue in the 30s. But within two years, Stieglitz decided that rather than only showing photography there, he would also exhibit some of the contemporary painters and sculptors, particularly from Europe and those younger Americans that were following the European lead. And that caused a huge rift in the gallery, as one can, can imagine. They thought they had it all to themselves, and all of a sudden there are painters and sculptors encroaching. And so only a few of the photographers remained loyal to Stieglitz for the next few years as he turned this gallery into really an art gallery for modern art. In the early years of 291, he started to introduce painters and sculptors that had a more 19th century sensibility, people like Toulouse-Lautrec and Henri Edmond Cross, who was a French neo-impressionist, uh, these were works that were not necessarily modern because of the style in which they were done, but more for the subject matter, especially with someone like Toulouse-Lautrec. I've picked a kind of tame one, but this is part of a large suite of prints that basically um, document the life of the prostitutes in Paris. He would, for the most part, collect works 
from each of the exhibitions that he showed. Either they were collected because he purchased them directly, like the toulouse lautrecs in fact, he purchased before he showed the suite. So when he showed them, none of them were for sale. But he wanted American artists to see what was happening in Europe. He also acquired works through gifts from the artists and thanks for showing his, their work, and also kept some as repayment for expenses that he laid out for shipping them from Europe, for reframing, for publishing their brochures, etc. It was really, um, people like Toulouse Lautrec and Cross were creating beautiful works. And they did create a splash in New York, but it was really when he started to show the Europeans modernists, such as Matisse and Picasso, that it got everyone riled up. And that was exactly what Stieglitz liked. He liked to cause trouble. He liked to cause discussion and dissension and discussion. And he wanted people to be open-minded, as he was, to seeing that these kinds of works could be as uh, expressive and important to people as beautiful watercolors by Cross or lovely prints by Toulouse-Lautrec. When he showed Matisse in 1908 for the first time at his gallery and Picasso in 1911, these were also those artists' first exhibitions in America. He really was in the forefront of what was happening and sometimes it was not because he himself understood this work I personally don't think he really understood what Cubism was about in 1911. But because he had great advisors like Edward Steichen, the photographer who was also a painter and traveled to Europe a lot, and the caricaturist Marius de Zayas, who also frequently traveled back and forth across the ocean, these were people who had connections with the art world in Paris and were making studio visits to Matisse and Picasso and would come back and say, you know, Alfred, we need to really show these guys because uh, this is important. Between the two, between Matisse and Picasso, Stieglitz and Steichen had a lot of correspondence about showing their work and they both agreed that between the two that Picasso would be the bigger man. And so they had that exhibition in 1911 at the gallery of Picasso's work, where Stieglitz purchased this standing female nude, which, well, I see it as a nude. I hope you see it as a nude. Uh, but, but a lot of people didn't, and some of you might not. And in the press, it was called a fire escape, and not a very good one at that. <laughs> Stieglitz had brought 83 Picassos to New York, which was a huge amount. Not all of them were on the walls. Some of them were in the back room in portfolios and could be seen privately. But when the show closed, there were only two works that had been purchased, this one and one other. And the sad, the sad tale is that when he offered the Met the other 81 pieces for $2,000, we turned it down. <laughs> This is a, another Picasso that was in a later show from 1915, uh, one of his papier collé, which are, is a newspaper pasted onto um, a drawing, and it, he purchased it for $150. Amazing, huh? Kandinsky's painting was one of the few works that, that Stieglitz actually purchased just because he felt he needed to keep it in America. It had been shown at the 1913 Armory Show, and it was ridiculed there, as one can imagine, for being so abstract. But he felt that Americans needed to see this kind of abstraction, and so he purchased it. He never gave Kandinsky a show, but he kept this work in his first gallery at 291 uh, throughout, you know, after 1913 for artists to refer to. Over the 40 years that Stieglitz was an art gallery owner, he didn't like to be called a dealer, but of course he did buy and sell things. Uh, over those 40 years, he acquired about 600 paintings, sculptures, and prints, not to mention all of the photographs that he himself made and that his associates made that became part of his collection. Uh, this is an artist who, Gino Severini, the Italian futurist, 
This was the last European artist Stieglitz showed in his gallery at 291 in 1917. This was the last show um, before, the, before, the ex, before the gallery closed. This was the last European. And its diamond shape is particularly notable. Uh, even today, very few diamond-shaped paintings. And so one would have assumed that when it was shown in the gallery, it would have elicited a lot of press coverage. It didn't. And I think that was because Stieglitz hung it incorrectly, that he hung it square. Because when the Met acquired it in 1949, we hung it square. So it must have had its hanging brackets in that direction. And it was only after the artist found out that we owned the painting when he wrote us a letter saying, I'm really glad this is in your collection, but could you please turn it this way? Oops, and he drew a diamond shape. The, the painting is a, um, it's, it follows Severini's theories about uh, equivalencies. These, the title is Dancer equals Propeller equals C, and it was from 1915. And he believed that you could combine unrelated elements in a canvas, and as long as the artist found some sort of visual correspondence between them, um, you could create a composition from that. And so in the center is what seems to be, let's see if I can get this, perhaps the head and neck of a dancer. You can see you know, knees bent and maybe clothing, uh, but it's also the sense of a propeller and this, the sense of spinning, just having it on the diamond shape makes you feel disoriented. Uh, and of course, the waves of the sea over here. When Stieglitz agreed to show Severini's work, he had never seen it before in person. Severini had not been in America, had not shown here. And he wrote to Georgia O'Keeffe when the exhibition finally opened to say, the color is acid and gives me the creeps. Had I seen them, I never would have offered the hospitality of 291 to them. I don't believe in futurism, nor in its very noisy noise. One of those uh, advisors for Stieglitz for choosing European artists to show in New York was the Mexican-born caricaturist Marius de Zayas, who unfortunately even today is very little known. He's, he's, he was a fabulous artist, very witty, made gorgeous charcoal drawings. Uh, he basically satirized, um, well, the group that we have, which are 40 drawings by him, uh, he satirized the photographers and painters and Stieglitz himself that were part of the 291 circle. Uh, we own six caricatures of Stieglitz. Two of them are on the screen here. One, a rather traditional view of caricature, and the other one on the right, an abstraction where he equates Stieglitz to a soul catcher. The soul catcher was a ritual object from the Cook Islands. It was a piece of rope with rope circles that ran up it on both sides. And of course, Stieglitz was literally the soul catcher of all of these artists and photographers. And since I can't help it because I love Desire so much, here's one more of Stieglitz as a box camera. This was a study for the journal 291 that Desaius and a group of other 291 members started. The sense of abstract uh, portraiture, I just wanna, this is one of the themes that kind of runs through the exhibition and this collection are abstract portraits. So it's perhaps not a literal portrait, it may not be something you can actually see a figure, but in this case, Marston Hartley uh, paints a portrait of a German officer and the very vertical sense of this uh, collection of symbols and signs and lines and design gives you a sense of a figure without it being literally a figure. All of the, uh, all of the elements in this canvas um, relate to a particular officer, Karl von Freiburg, who was Hartley's great friend, possible lover, and who unfortunately died during the first months of World War I. Hartley was, state, was living in Berlin. He and Stieglitz both had a great affection for the German people and the German culture. Stieglitz's family had originated from Germany and he had been educated there. And uh, Hartley just felt very accepted in Berlin, which was a rather um, 
lively and open liberal city for someone who was gay. So he paints this, uh, a series of German military paintings of which this is the largest and the most personal for the artist. He really felt um, a close connect. The other ones in the series are much more generically about the military and the, the flags and the medals and the epaulets and all of that. But this one is, the, is dedicated to von Freiburg. And when Hartley came back to New York um, to show these works and because the war was happening and I guess people kept telling him to come home, uh, this was the one canvas that he brought on the ship with him. The other ones were all shipped back separately to New York. One of the other great uh, abstract portraits in the collection is Charles Demuth's I Saw the Figure Five in Gold from 1928. It's, in this case, it's not a tribute to an actual figure, but it is a tribute to a poem written by Demuth's friend, William Carlos Williams. And it's in his precisionist style, hard-edged, sort of urban subject matter, uh, which was what he became known for in the 1920s and 30s. But it, and this was the works from this series were the first things that Stieglitz showed in his gallery of Demuths in the 20s. Prior to that, they had known each other since 1914, and Demuth always wanted to be part of the Stieglitz gallery. Stieglitz, however, kept putting him off, very uh, gentlemanly, but he would always defer him to another dealer, and it seems as if uh, the reason is that he felt that Demuth would be too much competition for another watercolorist in his stable, John Marin. And I'll show you just why in a, one second, but just to um, give you a little more detail about this great painting. This is the center part is a, fire, is a bright red fire engine. That's what the poem that Williams wrote. It was about a fire engine with the number five from the Ladder Company Five screaming down a New York City street on a dark rainy night. And so you get the sense of the rain coming down, the light fixtures in the city, and this receding five that keeps going down. This is the other side of Demuth, which is amazing that he was able to maintain two such very dissimilar styles, uh, the hard-edged precisionist version and then these incredibly beautiful, lyrical, watery watercolors where he not only, um, this is a particularly watery one. A lot of his have uh, pencil underdrawings where he, with great precision, is able to lay out these color within the lines. Nothing bleeds, nothing uh, goes over. It's just an amazing talent that he had. But this was the work that he thought that was too much of a competition for John Marin because Demuth's work was cheaper and for the most part his, subjects ma his subject matter were flowers and landscapes and pretty still lives and was much more commercially viable at this time. Oops, I'm sorry, wrong click. Uh, Marin's work was the artist that he really, the watercolors that he really championed for more than 30 years. They were friends. He, Marin showed in all of, all three of Stieglitz's galleries in New York. And by the end of uh, the last gallery, An American Place, Stieglitz had uh, refocused himself. Not only had he focused on American art after he closed 291 in 1917, so the 20s, 30s, and 40s are all about American artists, but he also narrowed it even further to only showing John Marin, Arthur Dove, and Georgia O'Keeffe. We happen to have 140 works by Marin in the collection, the largest number by any single artist. We have, and of those, only two of them are oil paintings, and the rest are drawings and prints. So that's a huge amount of works on paper, and although Marin's name is very well known in the art world, um, our collection is rarely on view of his work because they are works on paper and they, they are light sensitive and fragile and if we want to keep them looking good, we have to put them in storage. So unfortunately, after this exhibition, 
a lot of the works that you can see in it will probably not be shown literally for years, just to try and maintain their freshness. And because we have so many Marins, we have two galleries in the exhibition, early watercolors like this of the Brooklyn Bridge and his Paris years, and later watercolors in, a, in another room of the 1920s and 30s when he was basically um, focusing on views of Maine where he had a summer home and traveled every year after 1914. This one is sunspots, a really near abstraction where you can see the sunspots in the sky, you get the sense of the motion of the water, and I think that in the lower right, that pink sort of blob must be a swimmer. Here's another view of Maine along the coast. Some of them are more abstract, like sunspots. Here, a view of a sailboat and a town along the coastline. Another, uh, along with Marin, Arthur Dove was a longtime friend and one of the artists who was also represented in all three of his galleries. This is another abstract portrait, this one of his neighbor on a houseboat in Long Island. This is a portrait of Ralph Dusenberry from 1924, which is an assemblage of found materials and paint. So you have pieces of wood that could represent uh, birds or, or the fish or Dusenberry himself and other references to, uh, there's a nautical flag in the upper left, uh, references to Dusenberry himself, the folding ruler around the border that forms a frame is supposedly a reference to his having been trained as an architect, and the mu little sheet of music at the very bottom is the song that he supposedly sang when he was drunk on his boat. But Dove, aside from doing works that are somewhat large, the Ralph Dusenberry is really not a huge painting, it's sort of this size, um, and he painted a few oil paintings that were 30 by 40 inches. A lot of the works in our collection are small little sketches that are about five by seven inches, the size of an index card, and these were the studies that he painted outdoors in the landscape. These are views of the water around Long Island, where he lived for many years, and of the animals that were on the farm where he, his family had a home up in Geneva, New York, where he also spent a lot of time. These are beautiful, tiny little gems, and I wasn't even able to put all of them up in the exhibition, but what he would do, the reason that they were this size, was that he would then put them into a, some type of projector. There were different types, and these, that five by seven, four by six inch size was what fit into these machines. And then he would project the work on paper onto a canvas or a board and be able to outline the lines that were projected. So the work in the lower left of a goat, he then projected into this. And that's an oil painting. And almost, when you see them in the exhibition, they're side by side and they're really line for line uh, the same composition, but in a larger format and um, a slightly sort of denser paint style. The last artist, I'm really blitzing through the collection of 200 things, but the last artist is Georgia O'Keeffe, who had a very special place in Stieglitz's life. When he first saw her drawings, one of them being the one on the screen here, uh, these were abstractions that he saw in 1916 and immediately gave her an exhibition. And he not only loved her work, it, the boldness of it, the abstraction of it, it was what the men in his galleries were doing and he supposedly said, you know, something like, at last, a woman on paper. And although nobody's really been able to um, find that specific quote, there are letters where he writes to other people and he paraphrases that phrase. And so that was what he was thinking. He was looking for, he had shown other women in the gallery, a few, a few painters, um, but she was the one that he felt could really hold her own among the men. And he gave her this exhibition in 1916, followed by another the following year. And he really fell in love with her, I think, through her art before he had ever even met her. 
When he did meet her, it was really love at first sight, and they became um, a couple immediately. Eventually, they married in 1924, and um, he was, this is one of her great early paintings, Black Iris from the 20s. Uh, these, this was the type of work that she became famous for, these enlarged flowers. She, the idea, she said, was to make people stop and look at things that they overlooked. And so she would take what was, you know, a tiny little head of a flower and blow it up 30 by 40 inches and bring it close to the, the canvas and to the viewer's eye. She was inspired by the landscape around Lake George where the Stieglitz family had a summer home and she and Alfred Stieglitz would spend long summers, you know, three, four months at a time up there. They each had their own studio. Stieglitz was taking photographs and he took a number of Georgia O'Keeffe from the time he met her and we have only six of the 300 plus photographs that he made of her uh, in the exhibition but they go from her being a sort of prissy school marm to disrobing and then the evolution of their relationship and of herself. It was a composite portrait that he could create from the time he met her until he died, oh, and actually until he put down his own camera in the 30s. When she starts going to New Mexico in 1929, in part to get away from Stieglitz and a difficult marriage, and in part to find new inspiration for her art, she begins to paint uh, canvases like this, Cow Skull, Red, White, and Blue, which was, um, again, bringing the image close. Uh, and in this case, she sort of satirizes the uh, movement in America for, of American writers and artists to paint the great American painting, um, the, to write the great American novel and all, and she, because she felt she knew better what America was about, and it wasn't always a dilapidated ranch or a, um, that, that bones like this, skulls and bones, were in, had an enduring beauty and a, um, a great strength that was what America was to her. When Stieglitz dies in, died in 1946 at age 82, he had this enormous art collection, 600 or so painting, sculpture, drawings, and prints. And I, I don't really know the total number, but I know uh, the photographs at least, probably 2,000, maybe more. There were at least 1,500 in the key set at the National Gallery uh, in Washington. So it's a huge group of artworks that he had not given O'Keefe any instruction about what to do about them. He did talk along the way. He had always imagined that the collection would be kept together as a tribute to the artists and the gallery and what he had tried to do to introduce Americans to modern art. But he never wrote it down on paper and he never really specified how, where he thought it should go. Uh, he, so he left it to O'Keefe, who was his widow and executrix, to decide. And although Stieglitz himself had had mixed feelings about the Met ever since his 291 days when we turned down those 81 Picassos and we turned down a group of Rodin drawings and things like that, he felt the Met had never endorsed the artist that he was endorsing. And that uh, there are all sorts of sort of funny letter comments where he writes to people saying, you know, the Met is basically a, a cemetery for dead artists and that the people who run it, the trustees, are people with a lot of money but not a lot of taste. And, um, and he might not have been so happy that this collection wound up here, but he had left it to O'Keefe to make the final choice. And in, with great pragmatism, I think, she realized that no one institution was going to be able to deal with the volume of artwork. You could not be showing 600 pieces at one time. And so even uh, she decides that the Met will be the, the recipient of the lion's share of this collection. So we received over 400 of the paintings, sculpture, drawings, and prints that he had. And we can only show half of them in our uh, exhibition, so I always 
sort of laugh and say, well, you know, part two will be coming, but, but truly probably not, um, or at least not for a very long time. <laughs> so it is a great tribute to the Met and to Stieglitz and to O'Keefe that we're able to present this exhibition today. Um, it is, he really was a visionary um, gallery owner who promoted artists and was open to all kinds of new ideas and wanted Americans and American artists to be open to that too. And so we hope that this exhibition brings that to life. And now we will be showing, if you have time, and unless you're running up to the exhibition at this moment, uh, please stay. We're showing about an 11 minute short film, Manhattan, which has been remastered. Uh, and that's the film that Charles Sheeler and Charles Demuth uh, created in 1920 based on their photographs of New York City with Walt Whitman poetry sprinkled through. And after that, immediately after that, Jessica Murphy, a colleague in my department and, and co-conspirator on this exhibition and catalog, will be offering an, a lecture about uh, some of the Stieglitz artists and their views specifically of New York City and then again, that will be followed by two very short films of showing New York as a changing metropolis. Thank you so much for coming. Good afternoon. I am Jessica Murphy. I am a research associate in the Department of 19th Century Modern and Contemporary Art here at the Met. I've been working with our curator, Lisa Messenger, for a number of years now on the Alfred Stieglitz collection, catalog, and exhibition. Manhattan is a little bit of a tough act to follow, but I will do my best by continuing our New York theme for the afternoon with a look at the ways the artists of the Stieglitz circle depicted the city where Stieglitz had his galleries and they often lived and worked. I have many images for you from both within and beyond the Met's own Stiglitz collection. In March 1913, the French artist Francis Picabia gave an interview describing his first impressions of New York City. He said, your New York is the cubist city, the futurist city. It expresses in its architecture, its life, its spirit, the modern thought because of your extreme modernity, you should quickly understand the studies which I have made since my arrival in New York. They express the spirit of New York as I feel it and the crowded streets of your city. Their surging, their unrest, their commercialism, and their atmospheric charm. Picabia was visiting Manhattan on the occasion of the International Exhibition of Modern Art commonly known as the Armory Show. The Armory Show had been organized by a group of American artists and other experts in the field, including Alfred Stieglitz, and it included about 1,200 works by an international roster of some 300 artists. The main draw of the exhibition was a provocative selection of new work from avant-garde artists whose expressionistic and abstract styles challenged and often outraged their viewers in 1913. In the run of just four weeks, before it moved to venues in Boston and Chicago, the Armory, Tro the Armory Show attracted an estimated 100,000 viewers. It was the event that marked New York as a destination for creating, viewing, and selling avant-garde art. Yet New York had already attracted certain artists as an ideal subject to explore and interpret in their work. The city was undergoing a dramatic transformation, just as the visual arts were, and many artists took advantage of the dynamic shift between old and new New York, as well as between traditional and innovative artistic styles. They portrayed the imposing structures and teeming crowds of the metropolis and they merged this new subject with new ways of representing the world around them. This lecture will begin with a brief summary of New York's changing appearance during the early decades of the century, 
followed by a look at five artists affiliated with Alfred Stieglitz, Francis Picabia, John Marin, Max Weber, Charles Demuth, and Georgia O'Keeffe, and the ways they experienced and depicted the city over those years. New York's transformation was a common topic of discussion amongst New Yorkers in the early 20th century, much as it is today. An article published in the New York Times in 1925 stated, wherever the New Yorker walks through his streets, old and familiar structures come tumbling down about his ears, and new ones rise to uncounted floors. It is a drama of restless change. Manhattan's growth had earlier been more concentrated in the blocks around City Hall and Wall Street. By the second decade of the century, it had spread upwards to Midtown and beyond. The financial district was now crammed with the headquarters of various corporations, law firms, brokerage houses, and public utilities, while Midtown Manhattan saw the rise of new office buildings, theaters, hotels, and apartment buildings. Thanks to, do, to new technologies and construction, large buildings could rise higher than ever before. Instead of resting on weight-bearing walls of thick masonry, the new towers had exteriors suspended on a cage-like skeleton of lightweight steel. Improvements in the passenger elevator and large plate glass windows made the taller buildings more accessible and gave them a bright view of the surrounding city. One after another, Newer, taller skyscrapers punctuated the city's profile. The city was also expanding downwards and outwards as travel in and around Manhattan expanded its reach. Grand Central Terminal opened in 1912. New bridges linked the city's five boroughs. The elevated train that had been constructed in the late 19th century was supplemented by the underground subway system of 1904. On the streets, horse-drawn carriages and coaches were being replaced by motor buses, taxi cabs, and private automobiles. Electric lighting transformed the city's appearance, particularly at night. And lastly, an unprecedented wave of immigration changed the collective human face of the city. The population of New York escalated by two million inhabitants between 1900 and 1920 rising to over five and a half million. By 1930, it was numbered at nearly seven million residents. With so many diverse populations sharing the city, often at close quarters, every block and every street corner seemed to host a story worth watching. The city itself, its architecture and human presence had become a spectacle. Of course, not every group of artists portrayed New York in the same way. The American Impressionists tended to depict New York's avenues and parks from elevated or distant viewpoints, with an interest in the picturesque effects of light and an overall mood of tranquility. The so-called Ashcan School, on the other hand, was a small group of urban realists who concentrated on grittier aspects of daily life including the world of the tenements. The artists of Stieglitz acquaintance, yet another circle, took their own approaches to capturing the city around them. Although I'm concentrating on paintings and drawings by artists affiliated with Stieglitz, rather than Stieglitz's own photography, it's worth noting again that Stieglitz was already engrossed in New York's possibilities as a subject for the visual arts at the start of the century. He had been photographing New York City since the early 1890s, and several of his city scenes were already well known through exhibitions and their publication in his journal Camera Work. In Old and New New York, for example, he contrasted the construction of the massive new municipal building in 1910 with the surrounding 19th century edifices of older Lower Manhattan. When Francis Picabia made that first visit to New York in 1913, he quickly made contact with Stieglitz and began planning his first exhibition at Stieglitz's gallery. 
In the meantime, his art provoked a great deal of debate at the Arbery Show. His painting Procession Seville, seen at left, was one of the most notorious works in the exhibition. It was frequently mentioned and occasionally lampooned in the popular press, as we see at the right. In this cartoon, a caricature of the artist looks at procession and exclaims, ah, mon dieu, they have hang him, my masterpiece, upside down. <laughs> Picabia was also busily immersing himself in the experience of his host city during this visit. He described his reaction in another interview. I see your stupendous skyscrapers, your mammoth buildings and marvelous subways, the tens of thousands of workers and toilers, your theater crowds at night. I walk from the Battery to Central Park. My brain gets the impression of each movement. I hear every language in the world spoken. Picaviet quickly translated his experience of New York into a series of new works, even during the visit. They were abstract compositions that convey the energy of the bustling metropolis with forms that suggest skyscrapers, steam released from smokestacks, and the movement of crowds and vehicles. Picabia exhibited some of these dynamic new works at 291 Fifth Avenue in March of 1913, including two works titled Negro Song. Both Negro songs indicated Picabia's interest in the analogy between visual art and music as well as his introduction to a specific kind of New York entertainment. The New York World informed its readers that Picabia's American friends had brought him to a variety show in New York at which he heard an African-American vocalist, and this painting was his impression of the performance. New York was a center of both ragtime music and vaudeville entertainment in 1913, and Picabia could have visited any number of concert halls or nightclubs to hear African-American musicians performing. Ragtime, a forerunner of jazz, was a new and fitting style of music for a city that was itself undergoing rapid transformation. John Marin, who eventually became one of Stieglitz's closest friends and most enduring business partners, returned to New York from his European travels in 1910. By 1911, Marin had begun to paint the canyon-like streets of Lower Manhattan and their new skyscrapers. He wrote to Stieglitz, I have just started some downtown stuff, and to pile these great houses one upon each other with paint, as they do pile themselves up there, so beautiful, so fantastic. At times, one is afraid to look at them, but feels like running away. In his watercolor titled St. Paul's Manhattan, Mag Marin's signature style is already apparent. He took as his central motif the downtown landmark of an 18th century church located at Broadway and Fulton Street in a composition that underscores the city's juxtapositions of old and new, history and progress. St. Paul's Chapel had the prestige of having been attended by George Washington and other prominent historical figures. For early 20th century viewers, however, its Georgian-style tower rose against a contrasting background of newer, taller buildings that were dedicated to business rather than spiritual matters. These include the double-towered Park Row building to the immediate left, and seen directly behind the church's steeple, the St. Paul Building. Another landmark of Lower Manhattan that captured Marin's imagination was the towering Woolworth Building on Broadway, across from City Hall. In commissioning a design for this structure, Frank Woolworth reportedly said to the architect Cass Gilbert, I do not want a mere building. I want something that will be an ornament to the city. Gilbert's Tower, which combined Gothic detail with state-of-the-art construction, was the tallest building in the world when it was completed in 1913. In a series of etchings and watercolors, Marin depicted the Woolworth Building over and over as though he were a portraitist attempting to capture his subject in a variety of moods. In some images, 
the Woolworth Building stands tall and vertical over Broadway and City Hall Park. In others, it appears to tilt or twist or expand, although it were a living, breathing thing. As Marin wrote, the whole city is alive. I see great forces at work, great movements, the large buildings and the small buildings. In the 1920s, even more than in the previous decade, New York was pulsing with the excitement of a rapidly rising skyline, a prosperous economy, a vibrant cultural scene, and a diverse growing population. As Marin humorously wrote to Stieglitz in 1924, it was the land of jazz, lights and movies, the land of the money spenders. For a watercolor of 1929, Marin took as his subject the celebrated avenue of Broadway as it passes through the heart of the city's entertainment district. In Broadway night, mosaic-like rectangles evoke the theater marquees and neon billboards of Times Square against a night sky, and patterns in the foreground suggest the passing traffic. We can identify the distinctive Chevrolet emblem and the glowing scrolls of the sign below it, which may have been an advertisement for Pepsodent toothpaste. Even the artist's signature at lower right, enclosed in a small rectangle, resembles a bit of neon signage. In the following decades, Marin experimented with more distant vantage points. He frequently painted from the Brooklyn waterfront, from the scenic outlooks of the Palisades in New Jersey, and even from ferry boats approaching the island of Manhattan. Before his eyes, the skyline was taking on new forms. New zoning regulations of 1916 had required tall buildings to recede in angled setbacks on their higher stories in order to allow more light to reach the streets below, resulting in distinctive step-like silhouettes. One of Marin's favorite new landmarks with this setback profile was the Barclay Vesey Building built in 1926 on West Street. This 32-story Art Deco tower, the headquarters for the New York Telephone Company, was commonly known as the Telephone Building. In Related to Downtown New York, it dominates a view of Lower Manhattan against a pale red wash of sky and a background of other architecture, including the skyscrapers of Wall Street. A ferry and a tugboat in the river guide the viewer's eye towards this imposing panorama. And a decade later, Marin's motive telephone building returned to this landmark while acknowledging the skyline's continuing transformation. The telephone building is again the central motif. Around the hectic cluster of skyscrapers, Marin's composition splinters into a loose arrangement of abstract squares and rectangles some of them punctuated with stars and other geometrical shapes, as though the city were literally bursting with excitement. As one critic wrote of Marin, other artists have seen the surfaces of New York, but Marin sees New York itself, rearing monstrous pointed heads into a smiling sky. He sees the mechanical, swirling, vibrant life of the city. Unlike John Marin, the artist Max Weber had only a brief association with Stieglitz and 291. After studying in Paris, where he saw the work of Cezanne and Picasso, Weber returned to New York and began applying his Cubist-influenced style to depictions of modern life and the urban environment. He was introduced to Stieglitz by Edward Steichen, but their affiliation dissolved by 1914 possibly due to a business arrangement. Weber's cubist work included a series of New York subjects dating from 1912 to 1916. He was particularly fascinated by the city in motion, from its new transportation systems to its constant construction to the surge of its crowds. New York of 1913 is a kaleidoscopic view of the city seen from simultaneous, multiple viewpoints, 
with its elements fractured and rearranged into an energetically illogical composition. This work may have been inspired by the novel experience of seeing Manhattan from the high vantage point of a skyscraper. We can identify a park's green lawns and gray pathways near the bottom of the canvas and a section of rooftops at the lower right. Skyscrapers are abstracted into vertical white strips that tilt at various angles. The thick, dark cables of suspension bridges swing and arc through the upper portion of the canvas. And Weber explained that the gray, curving, snake-like form moving throughout the composition is the subway bringing together the city's various neighborhoods. Weber focused on this last aspect of the city's activity in the painting Rush Hour in New York, 1915. In this configuration of repeated angles, wedges, and zigzags, Weber suggests the clockwork motion of the city's twice daily mass commute. More specifically, he may be referring to the movement of a subway train through a tunnel, making frequent stops at the ever-expanding network of underground stations. A contemporary postcard shows a subway platform and tunnel that could have provided inspirations for the patterns and arches of Weber's rush hour. Stepping off the busy streets, Weber occasionally took the city's interior spaces as his subject. He described the origins of his painting Chinese Restaurant in this way. On entering a Chinese restaurant from the darkness of the night outside, a maze and blaze of light seems to split into fragments the interior and its contents, the human and inanimate. Weber's finished work evokes a multi-sensory experience of light, color, and sound. When we place it beside a photograph of one of New York's typical Chinese restaurants of the era, we can identify certain details. The checkerboard pattern of the tile floor, red wall coverings, the decorative carvings of wooden furniture, as well as a cluster of fragmented faces of waiters or customers that appears just above the center of the composition. The work is an evocation of New York's bustling dining culture, as well as an acknowledgment of the diversity of its newer immigrant neighborhoods. And closer to our present location, Marin paid an indirect tribute to the city's cultural offerings in his pastel slide lecture at the Metropolitan Museum of 1916. Weber recalled the experience of walking into an art history lecture in the Metropolitan Museum's auditorium. He wrote, a lecture on Giotto was given at the museum. The late hastening visitor finds himself in an interior of plum-colored darkness on leaving the glaring daylight, speed, and noise behind him. The darkness of the interior becomes a background on which one discerns the focusing, spray-like, yellowish-white light, the concentric circular rows of seats, a portion of the screen. Weber concentrates on the beam of light emanating from the projection booth and radiating through the darkness of the lecture hall rather than showing us the actual image that is projected on the screen. He is most interested in the experience of seeing and the secluded atmosphere in which it is done, particularly in contrast to the busy city outside the museum. Some artists in the Stieglitz circle lived in New York City year round, but others, like John Marin and Charles Demuth, spent a portion of every year in other locations. Demuth was a native of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in the 1910s, he divided his time between his hometown and New York while spending summers in New York, sorry, in New England resort destinations, such as Provincetown, Massachusetts. In New York, he rented a studio on Washington Square. Demuth's iconic painting, I Saw the Figure Five in Gold, which Lisa Messenger discussed earlier, evokes the sight and sound of a fire engine rushing down a downtown avenue. 
Its background is an abstracted cityscape that conveys the upward rush of the skyscrapers and the glow of the streetlights. Demuth was friends with many writers, performers, and other artists during these years as he entered enthusiastically into the bohemian nightlife of Greenwich Village. This neighborhood was a center of cultural ferment. After several decades of industrial use, it had recently been rezoned for residential properties. Its loft spaces and carriage houses became affordable housing and studio spaces for artists and an accompanying wave of cheap restaurants and bars provided the new tenants with meeting places. The watercolor, The Purple Pup, for example, is set in a basement tea room by that name. As the writer Anna Alice Chapin described The Purple Pup in 1917, one evening you go there and find it in full blast, the piano tinkling, many cramped couples dancing in two tiny rooms, and every table covered with teacups or lemonade glasses. Lots of the girls have their hair cut short. Demuth depicted more raucous village destinations, such as the Golden Swan, also known as the Hell Hole, located at 4th Street and 6th Avenue, unfortunately uh, since demolished and no longer in business. The Golden Swan was a saloon with rough wooden tables and sawdust on the floor, and it became a favorite of downtown's artistic circles, including the playwright Eugene O'Neill. Demuth included himself in his watercolor of the Golden Swan, in profile, sharing a table with the French artist Marcel Duchamp, who appears bemused by the behavior of a brightly dressed woman seated nearby. Demuth also pursued entertainment further uptown, letting his interest in ragtime and jazz lead him to Harlem clubs that featured live performance. He also frequented the nightclub located in the basement of the Marshall Hotel on West 53rd Street. The Marshall, or Marshalls, hosted jazz performers, and it attracted a diverse crowd that included many actors, artists, and writers. Demuth painted several watercolors of jazz bands on stage at Marshall's. Their fluid handling and energetic lines echo the excitement of these innovative performances. Demuth seems to have been interested in the mingling of types and subcultures that occurred in New York's night spots, where the boundaries of daily life were often blurred. This included not only the mixing of white and black patrons in jazz nightclubs, Bohemians and curious uptowners in village tea rooms and drinkers of all professions in downtown taverns, but also the overlapping of various sexual persuasions. In the scene titled Cabaret with Carl Van Vectum, Demuth depicted himself in a brown suit with his back to the viewer and the photographer Carl Van Vectum with blonde hair. Demuth himself is watching the crowd which also includes two male sailors dancing together at the right. Demuth, himself a gay man, was certainly an interested onlooker and possibly a participant in this aspect of the city's nightlife. However, Demuth was interested not only in the more performative or sensational moments of New York nightlife, but also in the more mundane scenes that occurred on the margins. He was a regular at the Brevoort Hotel, located on Fifth Avenue between 8th and 9th Streets, just above Washington Square Park. He often stayed there as a guest, and he also frequented the Brevoort's Basement Cafe, a popular meeting spot for artists, writers, and political activists. Yet in some watercolors of the Brevoort, he chose not to depict the lively gatherings of the literati and bohemians, Instead, he focused on the Brevoort's waiters and bartenders, the workers who helped to facilitate these social evenings, showing them in informal interactions and quiet moments between their duties.
Georgia O'Keeffe, as, we, as we've learned, is the artist most closely connected with Alfred Stieglitz in both a personal as well as a professional relationship. She painted New York for only a brief period of time in the 1920s. The city never became one of her signature subjects, but it represented a particular chapter in her biography and career. O'Keeffe and Stieglitz were married in 1924. In 1925, they moved into an apartment in the newly constructed Shelton Towers Hotel, a 34-story building located on Lexington Avenue between 48th and 49th Streets. O'Keeffe recalled, I had never lived up so high before, and I was so excited that I began talking about trying to paint New York. Her first New York painting on the right, New York with Moon, is a night scene that includes the upper stories and cornices of several tall buildings, as well as the Gothic revival spire of a nearby church. The glowing orb of the streetlight contrasts with the rectilinear forms of the architecture, bringing a spot of warmth to the claustrophobic stone and iron of the city street. Like her colleague John Marin, O'Keeffe was drawn to certain landmarks of the new skyline. Her most monumental New York canvas featured the so-called Radiator Building, an Art Deco skyscraper built in 1924. This building, designed by architects Raymond Hood and John Howells for the American Radiator and Standard Sanitation Company, was distinctive for its black exterior, golden ornamentation, and illuminated crown-like top. In O'Keeffe's vision of the Radiator Building, located on 40th Street near Fifth Avenue, the skyscraper soars above the viewer. Its monolithic appearance is given variety by the irregular patterning of its lit windows and by the scattering of streetlight orbs at the bottom of the scene. And in a touch of humor, O'Keeffe included a witty tribute to Stieglitz, which may be hard to see here. a little bit hard. She replaced the electrical signage of the nearby Scientific American building with the word Stieglitz in her painting, literally putting his name in lights. O'Keefe also took inspiration from her new address. Speaking of the Shelton Hotel and her painting Shelton with Sunspots, she said, I went out one morning to look at it before I started to work. And there was the optical illusion of a bite out of one side of the tower made by the sun, with sunspots against the building and against the sky. In O'Keeffe's recreation of that moment, the Shelton itself seems to emit a glow, and the severe lines of Midtown's architecture are enlivened not only by the sun's halo, but by undulating currents of haze and steam, and the sunspots that drift like gold dust or confetti. A reporter who visited the Shelton in 1928 to interview O'Keeffe wrote that their 30th floor apartment was austerely furnished and it seemed all window, windows overlooking housetops, steel framework, chimneys, windows to the east through which the panorama of the river and the bridge came flooding. O'Keeffe painted several panoramic views from the window of the apartment she shared with Stieglitz at the Shelton. They take in the East River and the industrial architecture of Long Island City in Queens. One of these paintings is the final work in our current installation of the Alfred Stieglitz collection upstairs. Physically, it is a small work, but its wide view makes it feel larger in scale. On both sides of its river, the narrow verticals of smokestacks puncture the chilly looking gray landscape and smoggy sky and the rooftops appeared to be whitened by snowfall. Also in 1928, O'Keeffe was quoted as saying, I realize it's unusual for an artist to want to work way up near the roof of a big hotel in the heart of a roaring city, but I think that's just what the artist of today needs for stimulus. However, after O'Keeffe made her first trip to New Mexico in 1929, she began seeking inspiration in that altogether different setting. 
which would become the destination for her annual summer travels. Although she continued to spend her winters in New York with Stieglitz, she made a permanent move to New Mexico after his death in 1946 and forged a lasting identity as one of the great artists of the American Southwest. As a conclusion, I'd like to return to that moment of the Armory Show in New York with a brief mention of one other avant-garde artist associated with that event. The French artist Marcel Duchamp, already notorious in Europe, was one of the hotly debated personalities of the exhibition. His painting, Nude Descending a Staircase, attracted more discussion and derision than possibly any other work at the Armory. It was called everything from an accordion to an explosion in a shingle factory. It was even parodied by a cartoon in the New York Evening Sun titled, The Rude Descending a Staircase, or Rush Hour at the Subway. <laughs> Despite New York's critical reaction to his art, Duchamp, like Picabia and the native-born artists of the Stieglitz Circle, admired the city's physical presence and creative spirit. He said in one New York interview, America is the country of the art of the future. Look at the skyscrapers. Has Europe anything to show more beautiful than these? New York itself is a work of art, a complete work of art. And ironically, the work of avant-garde artists in New York gave the New York public some new ways to look at their own city. The cartoonist who recast Duchamp's abstract walking woman in motion as an entire crowd of pushing, shoving New Yorkers seems to have grasped an affinity between these avant-garde artistic styles and the temperament and terrain of the city that hosted them. He was joined by others who applied these distortions and fragmentation to other imagined views of New York. In the early decades of the 20th century, New York gave its artists more and more new opportunities to exhibit and sell their work, as well as a wealth of ever-changing subject matter. At the same time, some artists used avant-garde styles as a fresh vocabulary for expressing the city's motion, variety, growth, and sense of constant surprise. Even within Stieglitz Circle, there was a range of approaches as these artists sought to capture the city with energy, humor, or precision. They shared this enduring source of inspiration with the central figure of their group. In his later life, Stieglitz looked back to his experience of New York at the turn of the century. He said, I often walked the streets of New York downtown, taking my hand camera with me. I loathed the dirty streets, yet I was fascinated. I wanted to photograph everything I saw. Wherever I looked, there was a picture that moved me. Thank you. I hope you will visit and revisit from Alfred Stieglitz's collection from Matisse to O'Keeffe, upstairs in the Tisch Galleries, open through January 2nd. And for the rest of our program today, we're showing two very short films, Manhattan Medley, which is a wonderful look at a day in the life of Manhattan in 1931, and Coney Island at Night, which is exactly what it sounds like. So I hope you'll stay and enjoy these final tributes to New York.